Good morning, Church of the Cross. It is good to see everybody here. And as John said, we're starting a brand new series called Hope. And you know, the Bible says that, that hope is something very powerful. It's something very positive and it, that hope is something good. And so when you think about hope, it's expecting something good. It's not just expecting what we have to look forward to in heaven, which is obviously something very awesome to look forward to, but it's also expecting to see God's goodness in our life right now, in this life. And you know, for me, um, when I think of hope, I think of vacation. And have you ever taken a really nice vacation, okay, when you are, are leaving town and you're actually able to disconnect? I'm not talking about a vacation where you stay at home and you have every good intention to, to go fishing and hang out at the beach all week, but you wind up doing projects. That's really not much of a vacation. I'm talking about a real vacation where, man, you're going out of state or you're going on the other coast and you're able to, to disconnect. And have you ever noticed when you're going on a real vacation, the week before, you can do the impossible? You know what I'm talking about? I mean, literally, all hell can break loose and you're going to rise above it. You are going to push past it. Why? Because there's light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going on vacation, man. There is hope waiting for me around the corner in just a week. Well, today, I just, I, as we start this series on hope, I, I want to look at like three difficult areas, three like dark places that, that can take place in our life that we need hope. And, and maybe you, as, even as I'm speaking here this morning, you can identify um, some uh, areas that you're lacking hope. The good news is there is hope through the difficult areas, through the dark places in your life. And I want to start off with look, looking at hope when you've messed up. And you know, one of the greatest examples of having hope when you mess up is Peter. And, and the, the examples that we're going to look at, we're going to look at three different examples. The examples we're going to look at today happen right after the resurrection. So after the resurrection, Jesus was on the earth for about 40 days, and, <clears throat> and he kind of popped in and out and had interaction with the disciples, I really believe, to give them hope, but also to give us hope as well. And his interaction with Peter was classic. Peter had a, this epic uh, meltdown before Jesus went to the cross. And, and Jesus, if you remember, he, he tells the disciples, hey, guys, uh, I just want to let you guys know, give you guys a heads up. I'm going to be arrested, and uh, you guys are going to abandon me. I don't know if you remember, but Peter raised his hand. He said, hey, Jesus, listen, I don't know about any of these other clowns, but you can count on me. I will never deny you. And and Jesus looked at him and said, hey, listen, by the time the rooster crows, you're going to have denied me three times. He, what happened, and that's exactly what happened. Jesus gets arrested. Peter's standing at a, at a fire warming himself. And this young lady comes up and says, hey, aren't you one of the disciples? And Peter said, no way. Another person said, no, man, you're one of the disciples, man. I'm picking up the accent. I'm picking up your voice. You're one of the disciples. He said, no way. I am no way one of those disciples. Then another person comes up and says, hey, you're one of the disciples. And he looks at the dude and says, hey, listen, I swear to you, I don't know this guy. And in Luke, it says when he said that, Jesus turned and looked at him. Now, can you just imagine for a moment the horrible feeling that had to sweep over Peter? He felt bad. I mean, Peter messed up in a very big way. And the Bible says right after that, he, he knew what he did. He went out and he whipped. Uh, he wept bitterly. And I know if I was Peter, I would have felt, man, you know, I'm done here. It's over for me. I just denied the one that I have lived with for three and a half years. I'm done as an apostle. I'm done as a disciple. I've lost all credibility with those around me. I'm sure Peter felt horrible, but there was a message that came that, that day that Jesus was raised from the dead. It actually came from, uh, from an angel to the people that had gone to the tomb of Jesus, and it's a message that singled Peter out, and here's the cool thing. Here's the takeaway for us here today. It didn't single him out for punishment. It singled him out for hope. And I want us to read Mark. It says, but the man said, don't be afraid. You are looking for Jesus from Nazareth, who has been crucified. He is risen from the dead. He is not here. Look, here is the place that laid him. Now go and tell his followers and Peter, Jesus is going into Galilee ahead of you. You will see him there as he told you before. And can you imagine that message? And they come running and, and saying, hey, listen, tell the disciples. And I'm sure as, as Peter heard those words, he said, man, man, I'm, I'm out of the loop. But then he heard the words communicated and Peter. 
and Peter. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, I'm not done with you, Peter. Even though you messed up in a major way, I want to see you. I love you, Peter. It's not over for you. So in the middle of this huge mess, Peter is able to receive hope. And I love this because, because when I see how Jesus deals with, Pe- with Peter, and here, this is some good stuff here. When we see how Jesus deals with Peter, we can understand how Jesus is going to deal with you and I. And that should give us hope. So what happens when we mess up? You know, what do we do when we mess up? And I'm not talking about making a mistake. A mistake is not asking for directions and you're wanting to go to Utah and you wind up in New Mexico. Okay, that's a mistake. A mistake is being a New York Yankee fan, okay? Ooh. Hey, I got them really riled last night, Saturday night, man. I was in a room full of New York Yankee fans. But I'm talking about really messing up. I'm talking about you messed up a relationship. Maybe you messed up a marriage. Maybe you messed up a business, a career. Or maybe you messed up in ministry. And there's a lot of different ways that you can mess up. Well, what do we do when we mess up? And you may want to jot this down. I didn't write this in your notes, but don't disqualify yourself from God ever doing anything with you. It's very normal to, to, to feel sorry. It's normal to feel bad. It's normal to feel remorse. But you don't want to stay there. You don't want to live there. Just to kind of give you a, a word picture in your mind. I don't know if you've ever went to rent a, a house or an apartment, and a landlord or the real estate agent takes you into this place, it's a dump, and you walk in, and it makes your skin crawl, and you say, there is no way. This place is unfit to live. Or maybe it's a hotel room. Okay, I remember when Karen and I went on our very first vacation as husband and wife. We went to the Blue Ridge Mountains, and this was before websites and virtual tours and, and reviews that you could find on a website that if you use those things, it could save you a lot of time and frustration. So what we would do is we would just drive and classic stand. I'm off the beaten path, you know, chasing something, and, and we come on to, we're tired, we're ready to, to uh, find a hotel, and we find this little Hole in a wall town with this one, you know, one hotel to serve the community. And we should have had a clue we were in trouble when we walked into the room. It had the dark paneling on the walls, it had a shag carpet, uh, you know, on the floor. And we go to bed that night, and all of a sudden, man, the, uh, the people from the next room come in, and obviously they've been drinking some of the local moonshine because they were very loud. They're very obnoxious, and I turn the light on, and I, I get ready to call the manager. When I flip the light on, there's roaches all over the place. I try to gross you out. I'm just telling you the truth, man. So I said, Karen, we are out of here, you know? It was not a, a place, you know, it wasn't a place that you wanted to spend the night. It wasn't a, a fit place. It wasn't a healthy place. And I, I just want to, again, paint a word picture. That's like your mistakes, that's like your mess up. It's not healthy to live there. It's not healthy to stay there. There's not helping you. It's in the wrong place. So practically, what do I need to do? How do I deal with this? Well, you begin by asking for, for forgiveness and receiving it. First John says this, but if we confess our sin, he will forgive our sins because we can trust God to do what is right. He will cleanse us from all the wrongs we have done. And man, this is one of those verses I've had to stand on more than once in my life. And what this verse says to me is, I get a fresh start. I get a clean heart. And I want to say this, just kind of to pause for a moment. Once you've received the forgiveness in, in your life, which is, you know, it's just a prayer away. Don't go down this road because this is very easy to do. You know, we receive the forgiveness of God in our mind and, and, and the enemy comes in with this thought and we many times can embrace this mindset that, you know, now I'm on B team. Now I'm on God's C team. Listen, you, we've got to believe God's message of hope for you and I. Romans 8, 31, 32 says this. So what should we say about this? If God is for us, no one can defeat us. He did not spare his own son, but gave him for us all. So with Jesus, God will surely give us all thanks. Isn't that a great verse? 
And let me just ask you to use your imagination here for a moment. Think about you get up in the morning, tomorrow morning, you go to your kitchen to get a cup of coffee, and when you go into your kitchen, there's a, a young man in a gleaming white outfit, gleaming white clothes. Some of you say, where's my gun, okay? <laughs> Wrong response. We should have a clue because of this gleaming white outfit that he's not an intruder but an angel. I guess he could be a Michael Jackson impersonator, but I'm going to go with angel this morning, okay? But the Bible says that we will entertain angels unaware. So he comes, so you walk in, he says, hey, sit down a minute, calls you by name. He says, I have a message from God to you. If God is for you, Stan, John, Holly, Tom, whoever, whatever your name, hey, I just want to tell you, if God is for you, no one can defeat you. And then that angel goes on and said, he did not spare his own son, but gave him for you, Tom, for you, Mary, for you, Holly. Or... So with Jesus, God will surely give you all things. And then, poof, he disappeared. Now, let me ask you, man, would you have a good day or would you have a good day that day? Now, chances are you would not go out and tell people you had an encounter with an angel, but you would be happy that day. Why? Because you had a message from God. And you knew that God was for you. And what would, you know, <clears throat> what would be going on in your life that, that day? You would be experiencing hope. You'd be experiencing a message from God that God is for us. And I, I want to say this. You don't have to wait for an angel to have a, a, a cup of Starbucks coffee with you to know that God is for you. God has given us his written word, and that is just as powerful as an angel coming and giving you that message. And we'll talk a little more about that in a moment. Here's number two. How about when, we're, when, we're, when we doubt? And we all go through that. You know, just some of us will admit it and others won't. But it happens to all of us. And, and I'm going to deal with it really kind of like the poster boy of doubting, and that's Thomas. John 20, verse 24 and 29 says this. Thomas, who was one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other followers kept telling Thomas, we saw the Lord. But Thomas said, I will not believe it until I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side. A week later, the followers were in the house again and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came in and stood right in the middle of them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand here in my side. Stop being an unbeliever and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you see me. Those who believe without seeing me will be truly blessed. Now, here's the deal with Thomas. He had two very good reasons why he should have believed. First off, Jesus personally told him and, and the disciples that, hey, listen, guys, I just want to let you know that I'm going to the cross. I'm going to be buried. I'm going to come back to life. He, he told them at least three times. So Thomas had Jesus' word. And then he had eyewitnesses. And these people are not like crazy people from National Enquirer. These are people that he knew. These are people that he lived three and a half years with. And these guys are, are, are just saying, hey, listen, Thomas, we, we saw Jesus. And Thomas is saying, yeah, right. He said, no, seriously, we have saw the Lord. And Thomas is saying, listen, man, uh, you know, I won't believe that until I put my fingers in his, nail, in his hands and my hand in his side. And notice he didn't say, I can't. He said, I won't believe and how Jesus deals with Thomas, again, should give you and I hope this morning. Jesus comes in and, and says, peace be to you. And now here, I love what happens next. Because he doesn't ignore Thomas. He doesn't punish Thomas. He doesn't, you know, banish Thomas. You know, he, he doesn't do those things. He didn't, look at, he didn't look at Thomas and say, Thomas, I can't even stand looking at you. Would you go into the other room, man? I can't believe you didn't believe me. Just go into the other room. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't look at Thomas and say, you can't be one of my disciples. He didn't look at Thomas and he also didn't look at Thomas and excuse him. He didn't look at Thomas and say, bless your heart. I knew you couldn't, couldn't. I know you can't help yourself. Jesus looked at him and dealt with the elephant in the room. Thomas, go ahead, 
Do what you have to do. You got to put your hand on my side. You need to check. Do what you got to do. You need to check out the nail prints. Go ahead and check out the nail prints. But you need to stop doubting and step into believing. And to Thomas's credit, he didn't make any excuses. What was his response? My Lord and my God. That is a great response. That is, uh, <clears throat> that's good judgment on Thomas's part. You may say, well, did Thomas continue to doubt in his life? No, he became this incredible apostle. He had a strong ministry where he planted all kinds of churches across India. He died a martyr, so he went from a doubter to becoming a martyr. Thomas made an adjustment. Thomas made a change. And what do you do when you're doubting? Do you say, well, you know, I just can't help myself. I'm just, you know, it's just in, in my DNA to be a doubter. Here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to make excuses. What you want to do is make some changes, make some adjustments. And a lot of times people say, well, you know what? I just can't help myself. And when you have that type of mindset, you are not helping yourself. You're not helping the situation. Because what you're doing is you're cutting off all help. You're cutting off all, all uh, resources because basically you're taking a white flag and surrendering that particular area and just saying, hey, I, I give up. I, I'm helpless over this. My challenge to you is to step into it, step into God and say, you know, acknowledge, hey, Lord, I've struggled in this area for a long time. God, I acknowledge that. But God, I trust that you're going to help me to overcome this, that you want to help me to change my thinking in this area, and he will. Here's the second thing is surround yourself with people of faith. Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember your leaders who taught God's message to you. Remember how they lived and died and copy their faith. You know, all of us have people in our lives that are ahead of us spiritually. And maybe it's somebody at work. Maybe it's somebody here at church or in your small group. Maybe it's a neighbor. These are people that are farther along than you in their relationship with God. And they're able to be kind of like cheerleaders in your life. They're the ones that, first off, we shouldn't be intimidated by. But the Bible says we need to copy their faith. They're the people that say, hey, man, you're going to make it. God's got your back. He's going to see you through this. Hey, I'm there with you. I'm going to walk you through it. And the Bible says that we, could, we should look to them and copy their faith. That's one of the greatest reasons for being a part of a small group. That's why we push them so, so huge here at Church of the Cross. And we want to encourage you because we want you to hook up with people that are, are farther along than you in their walk with God. And we want to let their, their faith rub off on you. And here's what, what happens is... You know, they come alongside you. They help you in your faith. They help you get on your feet. They help you overcome whatever it is you're facing. You, in turn, want to be that person to somebody else. And that's the goal. You want to take what God has done in your life and do that same thing to another person around you. Some of you say, man, I don't have anything to offer. I want to say this. With God, all things are possible. And if you'll just step into him, you will be amazed with what God will do in you and through you. And here's number three. You guys with me this morning? Yes. Here's number three. How about when you are sad and disappointed? And this is, a, this is a huge one. Many people are sad and disappointed because they don't think that God came through for them the way they thought God should uh, come through for them. And we're going to be looking at how Jesus dealt with a couple uh, disciples that were sad and disappointed. We're going to look at Luke 24. These guys are on their way back from Emmaus. They were at the crucifixion. And Luke 24, 13 through 21 says, that same day, two of Jesus' followers were going to a town named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking about everything that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and began walking with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Then he said, what are these things you are talking about while you walk? The two followers stopped looking very sad. The one named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know what just happened there? Jesus said to them, what are you talking about? They said, about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet who said and did many powerful things before God and all the people. Our leaders and a leading priest handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he would 
free Israel. Catch what they're saying. They're saying, man, this Jesus, he was awesome. He was powerful. He did some amazing things. And we were thinking that he was the one that was going to lead Israel into freedom and restore Israel's national power and, and get us out from underneath Rome. We had hoped that he would do that. We hoped that he was the one. But now we are down. We are sad. We're disappointed. And it's very obvious that they did not see the whole picture. And many times we don't see the whole picture. We're going through maybe something that, that's trying for us, and we allow sadness and disappointment to sweep over us. But God's saying, hey, listen, the story isn't over yet. The movie's not to the end. And remember how we talked about you can handle something when you know you're going on vacation, man. There's light at the end of the tunnel, man. There's hope right around the corner. I want to say that sadness has the opposite effect on you. It drains you. Just like hope pumps you up and gives you that burst of energy, sadness drains you. So you would have thought that Jesus saw these guys being sad and disappointed. You would think he would have, you know, he had revealed himself to them and just say, hey, guys, be of good cheer. It's me. But he took a different approach, which is very interesting. And let's look at uh, verses 25 through 32. Then Jesus said to them, you are foolish and slow to believe everything the prophet said. They said that the Christ must suffer these things before he enters in his glory. Then starting with what Moses and all the prophets had said about him, Jesus began to explain everything that had been written about himself in the scripture. They came near the town of Emmaus, and Jesus acted as he were going farther. But they begged him, stay with us because it is late. It is almost night. So he went in to stay with them. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took some bread, gave thanks, divided it, and gave it to them. And then they were allowed to recognize Jesus. But when they saw who he was, he disappeared. They said to each other, it felt like a fire burning in us when Jesus talked to us on the road and explained the scripture to us. Now, isn't it interesting? When these guys, again, were sad and disappointed and just thinking, man, Things didn't turn out the way we thought about. Jesus didn't say, hey, man, it's me. He took them to Scripture. And here's the powerful thing about God's Word. It's not just something to check off the, your to-do list every morning. Okay, I read the Bible, and now I can go have breakfast. I can go to work and not think about it anymore. God's Word is powerful. The Bible says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It could change you. It changed them. And all of a sudden, they said to each other, again, I want to read the passage, it felt like a fire burning in us when Jesus talked to us on the road and explained the scripture to us. They said, man, there's something going on inside. There's something great that's happening. Romans 15, 4 says, everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. The scriptures give us patience and encouragement so that we can have hope. When you're disappointed, when you're sad, it's often because we're looking out here and the circumstances may not be going well out here. And we're thinking, you know what? You know, I, there's no way I can have hope because things are negative out here. I want to give you some good news this morning. You can have bad things going on out here, but you can have hope going on inside of here as you begin to step into God and begin to read his scripture. For those of you that may be going through uh, a really dark time, maybe you're going through uh, the loss of a loved one, or maybe you're going through a, an illness, whatever that may be, fill in the blank, I want to give you some homework tonight or today. I want to encourage you. First thing you do when you get up in the morning, man, maybe when you're drinking your coffee or whatever, read Psalms 23. Then I want to encourage you to repeat that at night before you go to bed. Let that word be the last word that you read, the, your last thoughts before you go off to sleep. Matter of fact, I want us to read it together, uh, and we've got it on the overhead. Psalm 20, let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. All right, time out. Okay, we can all do this. Okay, I'm confident. Let's say it. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green pastures. He leads me to calm water. He gives me new strength. He leads me on paths that are right for the, for the good of his name. Even if I walk through a very dark valley, 
I will not be afraid because you are with me. Your rod and your shepherd's staff comfort me. You prepare a meal for me in front of my enemies. You pour oil of blessings on my head. You fill my cup to overflowing. Surely your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. That's a powerful word, word when you really think about it. And you may say, well, how is that going to change my marriage issues and my marriage problems? Or how is this going to change this other negative situation going on in my life? Actually, it will. It will be, as you begin to get a hold of God's word. Because God's word is hope you begin to realize, you know what, I'm not alone. You begin to realize, hey, I have the Lord. You begin to realize he is my shepherd. He is going to restore. He is going to walk me through that dark valley. I don't know how it's going to, to, to turn out, but God is with me. Do you believe that? God is with you, and as you step into God, as you begin to, to read his word and ponder it, it will begin to take root in your heart. It will begin to change you. It will begin to, what will happen is it will begin to change you, and all of a sudden you'll begin to see things differently. God will allow you to begin to see things from his per perspective, and you'll get a new perspective. Remember, there is hope when you've messed up. There is hope when you are doubting there is hope when you are sad and disappointed. We serve a good God. He is a great and wonderful Heavenly Father.